So I, I titled this sermon, uh, Getting Fat in 2018. A um, little play on words that we'll unpack in a few minutes, but uh, I have actually packed on five pounds preparing for the sermon, so uh, apparently I, I lived up to, to, to the title. But um, I wanted to kind of segue into um, the next year by kind of talking about this transition period that we, we find ourselves in every year, and that is, you know, Christmas has, was last week, and now tomorrow will be New Year's, and so we kind of always find ourselves in that gap in between celebrating um, the Word becoming flesh and then launching into what God has for us in the new year. And so a few months ago, when I knew I was going to be speaking today, I began to really pray, Lord, what would you, what would you have for us? And, and it was kind of interesting because, I, again, when you, when you speak on a holiday, you kind of feel compelled to tie your message into that. And the first thing that came to my mind was New Year's resolutions. How many of you are going to make some type of New Year's resolution? Okay. All right, about, about half of you, maybe, maybe not quite that many. Um, well, good news is if you're not making a New Year's resolution, that's great because 80% of them are going to fail, okay? So let me talk a little bit about why that is. What do you think the number one New Year's resolution is? All right, lose weight, go to the gym is also right up there. So the top five all center around in some way, shape, or form getting healthy. Whether we're going to eat healthy, we're going to lose weight, um, we're going to join the gym. When I used to go to the Y, we always laughed about the, the January to March members um, because in January there'd be this big, huge, massive influx of membership. And, and so all, all of a sudden there's all this competition to use the machines and everything. And we just knew if we could hold out till about March, um, 80% of those people would be gone and it would kind of be back to the, to the uh, old timers. But that is true that um, most of them center around um, weight and, and health and things like that. Um, about 80% of us generally make some type of New Year's resolution. And of those New Year's resolutions, about 80% of us aren't successful in accomplishing those New Year's resolutions. Now, I don't share that with you to discourage you from making a New Year's resolution. I don't discourage you from setting goals. In fact, I, I think that there's something godly about that. I'm excited about what Pastor Lowell has to share with us next week when he stands up here and he begins to share the vision of what God has for us um, next year. But what I have come to learn about, um, about setting goals and particularly New Year's resolutions, that, that, those, that, that 20 percent, those, those people who seem to set those goals and are successful are the ones that, that have some type of internal motivation. There's some type of deep internal drive that is going to propel them towards success. Now, for many people, they're going to set some type of New Year's resolution because there is some type of um, internal motivator. For example, maybe in the last few months they've had a physical and the doctor has said, hey, you know, based on your blood pressure, based on your weight, based on these things, you know, you're going to have to lose some weight or you're at a serious risk. For some people, um, you know, maybe they've had other kind of uh, medical or health diagnosis that compels them. Maybe there's been some other um, situation in their life. Maybe they've experienced some kind of um, financial crisis that is deeply, deeply impacted their family. And so they're going to set some type of goal um, that they're going to achieve, but there's a deep, deep internal motivation to accomplish that. Um, I've found myself in the last few weeks watching a lot of television, and my favorite type of shows to watch for whatever reason are, are more like war movies and things like that, especially, you know, like combat movies. And um, I love to watch, um, if any of you have ever seen it, Discovery Channel did this thing where they, they uh, went and kind of filmed these Navy SEAL guys going through Navy SEAL training and just the harshness of their, their condition. And, and I consider myself a man, but I consider them men above men to, to kind of watch. And I'm, I'm just watching how brutal that training is and how those guys are running into frigid water and they're, I mean, the moment I've got sand in places I shouldn't have sand, I'm going to be like, where's the bell? I'm out. I'm done, right? But <clears throat> these guys, and, and there's a huge population that actually don't succeed and don't complete training. The vast majority of the people drop out. But the ones that are successful is because there's an internal drive in them that's just deeply, deeply rooted and that they have this internal um, motivation propelling them to be successful. And so I want to challenge us as we start this new year to kind of take a look at this transition that we're in between these two weeks. And I want to maybe hopefully guide us to set some goals and objectives for 2018. But more importantly, I want to challenge us with some internal motivation. 
So I want you to think that, that last week we, we celebrated, uh, on New Year's Eve, we came, we celebrated the, the coming of the Christ King. We celebrated the birth of, of Jesus. Uh, John tells us that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. And, and I had the privilege the week before that of talking about how brutal that nativity scene um, could have been and should have been and, and all that Christ did. And then we were here on New Year's Eve and we celebrated that joy had come into the world. But oftentimes when we leave and, and when we celebrate that, we forget that the day after Christmas for many people didn't look any different than the day before. That except for those handful of people that were there, people in, in far off lands may have not even known that the Christ was born. In fact, Randy, Randy Bass said where he was at, it was so cloudy he couldn't even see the star. All right, so he had no idea until Mary Ann told him about it. All right? <clears throat> so I want us to think about the fact that we find ourselves in this unique time because, because nothing, I don't say nothing, but for a lot of people, the knowledge of Christ's coming hadn't reached them yet. And so the day after Christmas didn't look any different. That the world went on existing in, in its filth and in the way that it was and its brokenness and its hurt. In fact, when I got done speaking last week, Congressman Hudson came up to me and he, he and I were talking about the, the whole goat thing and he was reminding me that, that oftentimes when, we, when we're around those animals all the time, when we're around that, that smell and that stench, that we don't recognize it. And I, and I find myself all the time, I share with you coming home, and it's not until Katie smells me or, or says something to me about, gosh, you've been around the boat goats, you really smell like goats, that I'm even aware of it because I'm so familiar with that odor that it doesn't, that it doesn't offend me anymore. And I think about the world the day after Christmas that was so comfortable with its brokenness, so comfortable with its stench, so comfortable with the smell that it was completely unaware of its condition. But what they didn't realize is that this Christ has come and, and that, he is, that he has been born and has started this process of transforming the world. And so I want to kind of talk about how that, that transformation, this, this new life that we're being called into, this new life that Christ um, was born into to give us um, came at a cost, but it also was a process that it's something that you and I are, are walking through. And that, that, that there needs to be an internal motivation, an internal change that propels us to success. That despite the fact that Jesus has been born, many people were still broken. I love what Matthew says, that he says, well, it's not what goes into the mouth it's not what goes into someone's mouth that defiles them, but it's what comes out of their mouth that defiles them. In other words, it's out of the mouth that comes the confession of our heart that, that Matthew is reminding us that, this, that it's this brokenness that exists in our heart that needs to be transformed. That we can, we can change external things. We can lose weight. We can do things like that. But, but, and we can, we can try to become physically healthy. And there's nothing wrong with that. I encourage us to exercise more and to, to eat better and to become a, to become a church that, that takes care of the temple that God has given us. But the reality is that, that life change for you and I is not going to be motivated by external factors, that it's going to be motivated by an internal change, that we can put on nice clothes, we can say all the right things like I've challenged this before, we can put all the pretty happenings in our lives on Facebook, but the reality is that it's what's going on inside of us that's going to determine the change. And so as I began to inquire of the Lord, okay, for 2018, what does that mean for us? And I was reminded of an acronym that I was given years ago in my discipleship, and that was to be faithful, available, and teachable. And so I want to share for a minute how in 2018, I believe that God is calling us as a body to become faithful, available, and teachable, and how we need all three of those components to, to have internal change and internal motivation.
Jesus teaches this in his life. First of all, Jesus teaches us to be faithful because he came. He did what the Father asked him to do. Knowing the conditions that he was going to be born into, <clears throat> the life that he lived, ultimately being wrongfully accused and dying on the cross for my sins, yet through it all, he was faithful to do what the Father asked him to do. He demonstrated availability by taking my place on the cross, by coming as a sinless man and living a completely righteous life, he made himself available to be my substitute and to do for me what I was completely incapable of doing for myself. And he made himself available on a cross that was meant for me and placed in a tomb that was meant for you and I. And Jesus led a life that was not only teachable, but teaching. He often shared with his disciples the truth of God and reminded them that I only do what I see the Father do, that, that, that you see me doing things that the Father is teaching me to do, that teach it, the Father is leading me to do, and I'm, I'm teaching you to do that. And so I think this acronym can actually be seen in the Christ that we follow. And so how does that look for you and I? Well, let's talk a little bit about faithfulness. As I was kind of praying through faithfulness, the Lord reminded me of the story of Moses in Exodus 3. Now, Moses in Exodus 3 is when he encounters the burning bush. And he's out in the desert, and he sees this bush burning, and he notices that it's not being consumed by the fire. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that, but that would intrigue me a little bit. If I'm walking through the desert and all of a sudden I see this, this bush on fire and nothing's happening, I'm going to probably think that that's outside of the normal. That's, that's going to be pretty supernatural to me. And Moses was not ignorant of the things of God. So he goes over to check out what's going on, and all of a sudden the Lord begins to speak to him out of this burning bush. Now, let that sink in for a minute. How many of you in this room have heard the audible voice of God? Maybe a couple? I'm pretty sure that one time I was alone camping and I, and I heard a voice. I was, there was no one around. I heard a voice, but it was, it was very subtle. I was asleep and I woke up and it was kind of one of those, I'm not sure what I heard. I went back to sleep and then I, I'm pretty sure I heard it again. And so I sat up and I immediately said, Lord, you know, if that's you, you know, please, you know, and I began to pray. I just began to speak. But I've never been walking and hiking and all of a sudden see this bush on fire and this voice begins to speak to me out of that bush. But what was interesting to me is as the Lord began to share with Moses what he wanted him to do, Moses' reaction was not, okay, great, I'm in, let's go. What do you want me? He begins to have questions. Well, wait a minute, who am I to go? I mean, I, I'm not, I stutter, I'm not, I'm not capable, of, I'm not a great speaker, I'm not. I'm, he began to have all these excuses. I mean, do you understand that, I mean, when, when, we talk about, when we talk about faithfulness, I want to make sure that we understand that faithfulness is not absence of doubt, but faithfulness is obedience in spite of that, right? That, that Moses had this, I mean, no, he could not have had any better example of God speaking to him. And the audible voice of God is speaking to him, yet he still has doubt. So I want to challenge us in this coming year that, that despite the circumstances that's in your life, it, it's, it does not escape us no matter where we're at in our spiritual journey. Doubt doesn't always escape us, but faithfulness is what allows us to be successful over that doubt, that we continue to press in despite the circumstances that face us. And we see this over and over in the story of Moses. We see Moses completely trusting in God and then the circumstances happen and, and they become hungrier, they become thirstier, the armies begin to press against them and all of a sudden you see Moses going, I don't, what are we going to do here, God? And God's going, calm down. I, I've been, I was faithful yesterday. I'm going to be faithful tomorrow. I'm asking you to do the same thing.
contrast that with Saul. Children of Israel demanded a king, and God anoints an earthly king for them in Saul. But Saul was so consumed with his power and his thirst for power and and doubt, and he failed to be faithful to pursue God and failed to be faithful to be obedient to God, and it cost him everything. In fact, his lack of faithfulness was so obvious that God appointed the next king long before his kingship was terminated. Imagine that. You're so unfaithful in the job that you're doing that your boss goes ahead and hires your replacement long before they terminate you. And so I want to challenge us that, that this internal change happens First of all, when we're faithful to pursue the things of God. Doesn't mean that we're not going to, in fact, Jesus says fear not over and over and over. He recognizes there's going to be times of doubt and insecurity. But Jesus reminds us, hey, I've overcome the world. You're going to have hardship. I get it. But just be faithful. Just keep pressing in. I got this. I've overcome the world. I'll overcome these problems. I wonder what God is asking you to be faithful about this year. Maybe, maybe it's, maybe for some of you it's taking some deep, deep faith to trust Him financially. Maybe for some of you it's taking deep, deep faith to trust Him in an overwhelming, helpful situation. Maybe it's taking you being faithful to trust Him in your family life. I imagine most of you sitting here with teenage kids can understand that. Of what, of letting go of this, this child that you've been holding on to and trusting that God has got them and that they're becoming the man and the woman that God has them to be. I know for me, it was the faithfulness of my parents in my disobedience that drew me back to my faith, that in spite of my actions, it didn't change their reaction. The next thing for us is to be available. I was praying through, Lord, give me an example of available or, or maybe not so available. And the first thought that came to my mind was the story of the rich young ruler. In fact, it was interesting that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record some version of that interaction. So you have this, you have Jesus, and you have this rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and basically says, hey, I want, I want to experience and, and, and inherit everything that the kingdom of heaven has to offer, what I need to do. And Jesus immediately begins to remind him of some of the commandments, you know, you know, don't, don't kill, don't steal, don't, don't do these things. And he goes, yep, yep, done, got it, got it, hadn't done any of those things. And he says, okay, great, then um, why don't you give up your possessions and then come and follow me? And the rich young ruler walked away discouraged. And Jesus turns to his disciples and reminds them that it's impossible for a rich person to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And I was reminded in that moment that the rich young ruler had been faithful. He had been faithful to keep the commands that God had given him. except for the one and most important one, and that is, thou shalt have no God before me. And his unwillingness to give up his possessions, the things that he worshipped, made him unavailable to receive that what God had for him. How often do we hold on to things? How often do we, do we have our hands so full of the things that we want and the plans that we have that we're unwilling to just simply let go and make ourselves available to receive more? 
Contrast that with many of the disciples who gave up everything. They gave up their livelihoods. Jesus approached many of them while they were going about their daily jobs, whether that was fishing or tax collecting or whatever, and said, hey, come follow me. And they didn't respond, nah, man, I, I get off at five, come back then, you know, we'll, we'll catch up. Maybe we'll grab a cup of coffee and talk about it. I'd love to hear what you got for me. Maybe it's better than what I got, but I, I'm going to hold on to what I got right now until, man, what an opportunity they would have missed if that would have been the posture of their heart. Where is God asking you to make yourself available this year? What are you and I holding on to that he wants us to let go of so that we can make ourselves available to receive so much more? The last thing is teachable. I love this interaction in John 14 between Thomas and Philip and Jesus. And Thomas says to, to Jesus, says to him, speaking to Jesus, he says, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answers, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know I am the Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip goes on to say, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answers, don't you know me? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I'm the Father? And I love it. He tells them to go on. He goes on and tells them, I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do greater things. And he goes on to promise them that he's going to send this counselor, send this teacher who is going to lead them and guide them. I think what, what made that, that interaction so compelling to me is that the disciples had been faithful. They had been available. They had been following Jesus. They had been faithful. But even here, they're not without ignorance. They're not without doubt. They're not without misunderstanding. And Jesus doesn't look at them and go, ah, you fools, I give up on you. No, he looks at them and goes, hey, even in this moment, even in the midst of this, let me, let me teach you. Let me make sure you clearly understand. And just in case you forget, even after I'm gone, I'm going to send a Holy Spirit that's going to remind you, that's going to continue this discipleship process, that's going to continue to grow and teach you. Contrast that with the Pharisees. They knew the law. They knew it inside and out. In fact, they knew it so well and so intimately that they felt they had nothing left to learn. I challenge us to, to lend ourselves to the teaching of the Holy Spirit. That, that in 2018, we become a church that, that continues to be faithful. We continue to make ourselves available, but we also continue, no matter where we're at on our spiritual journey, to humble ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to teach us. Because I promise you, no matter where we're at on our journey, whether, whether you're here today for the very first time, and this is the first time you've heard anything of God, or whether you're the senior pastor of our body, there is still so much that the Holy Spirit has left to teach us. I think about the, the believer and the follower and the disciple that I am today compared to what I was 10 years ago. 
And I think about how much more I have seen God do and how much more I know about who God is now than I did even 10 or 15 years ago. I pray that we don't find ourselves falling in the trap of being a Pharisee. That, that we've read this book once or twice and we go, oh, I've got it all figured out. I, it amazes me every time I prepare just how layered this book really is. I mean, even as I was reading stuff, that, that preparing, I was like, oh my gosh, that would, be, that would be great. That would be great. And I came downstairs and I told Katie, I was like, I don't, there is so much to some of this text. I don't even know how to weed through it all. Passages I've read over and over and over, I suddenly see in a completely different light. I was reminded of is how easily I forget this lifelong transformation process that, that God is working in me. You know, when we, when we read these stories of men like Moses and David and, and the disciples, you know, we, we read it in a handful of pages and we forget that, that that was actually a lifelong process. That for many of them, this was weeks and, and days and years and, and, and it went on and on. And so often in our lives, we, we set these goals and objectives, and we live in this culture that wants instant gratification. And so we, we decide that we're going to engage in the things of God. And then, and then like the Christ story, Jesus is born, but the next day we wake up and I still smell like a goat. And so I become discouraged, and I go, well, this Jesus thing must not be real because he was born yesterday, and today I still smell like a goat. But perhaps the truth is, is the reason that I haven't changed is because I haven't been consumed by the things of God. That, that when I allow myself to be faithful to what He's calling me to do, when I make my heart available to His, to His Word, when I allow Him to teach me and grow me, that I'm consumed by the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that transformation in God's eyes does take place just like that. But he allows me the benefit of slowing it down and allows me to see it as it's really happening and experience it and enjoy it. One of my favorite prophecies comes from the book of Ezekiel. Now, many of you probably know, remember Ezekiel because uh, one of the stories that's often shared is how Ezekiel and God are having this conversation and, and the dry bones begin to become flesh and the tendons and he's, he's witnessing these bones in this desert rising up and, and, and giving life to flesh and, and tendons and, and everything. But, but that's, not, that's not the part of Ezekiel that I want to share with you. I want to I share this in closing. In Ezekiel 36, the chapter before, in verse 26, I think we've got it for the screen. It says, I will give you a new heart, and I will put in you a new spirit. I will remove from you your heart of stone and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my law. Church, that's our message for this year. As we close out 2017, old things die and new things are born. And God promises to give us a new heart. He promises us to give us a new spirit. He promises to be our God and that we get to be His people. And that change starts on the inside and comes out. Happy New Year, family.